Bingham be pleased to know that exactly 200 years after his birth here in his hometown of Arrow Rock, 150 of his admirers have gathered to celebrate his bicentennial with an exhibition of his art and uh, the launch of a new book that, that collects all of his letters and a wonderful symposium with three outstanding scholars and researchers who have spent years studying his life and art. And now for me to uh, have the privilege of introducing our first speaker. Dr. Margaret Conrad is the Samuel Soslin Senior Curator of American Art at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, where she also serves as the Interim Education Director. She's a very busy person. We're grateful to her uh, for spending the day with us here at Arrow Rock. She's nationally recognized. In my opinion, Dr. Conrad's in the opinion of many, uh, she is the leading uh, authority at this time on the art of George Caleb Bingham. She's recognized all over the country just in the last couple of years. She's been a guest curator at an important exhibition of uh, 18th, 19th, and 20th century American art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, where, of course, Bingham's masterpiece, Fur Traders Descending the Missouri Hangs, and also at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, and her, her talk today is Painting in Politics, Bingham's Canvassing for a Vote. Please join, join me in welcoming Dr. Margaret Conrad. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> oh, next. There are indeed recognizable faces in some of the political paintings, and certain features, such as the Arrow Rock Tavern and Canvassing for a Boat, are known landmarks. Yet the paintings themselves belie such literal readings. The reliance of Canvassing for a Vote on country politician and the reappearance of figures from drawings based on models are just two examples of Bingham's creative constructive mode. More recent scholarship has recognized how cleverly Bingham wove together elements of his experience to create synthetic images. Some writers interpret them as literal but symbolic, while others recognize that Bingham totally fabricated scenes based in real life. Today, many, including myself, agree that Bingham's scenes cogently summarize and distill a conglomeration of ideas and experience filtered through the artist's own idealizing vision. As a result, over time, Bingham's paintings have come to function much like promotional imagery, for instance, the Marvel Man, um, and have become, and just like the Marvel Man, it's that authentic idea. You know, he's the cowboy. Um, and for Bingham, they, um, his works, they give us the essence, if not the particulars. And because of this, Bingham's paintings, like Canvassing for a Vote, also serve to create national memories and reflect our collective desires. Uh, Dr. Stack has an intriguing title for her talk today, and we're so grateful to her for bringing with her uh, this wonderful painting from the collections of the State Historical Society. Dr. Stack's talk is titled Infant Deaths infertility, and infighting in-laws. <laughs> the thread of life as a reflection of the private life of George Caleb Bingham. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jones Thack. Now the other thing Bingham does here that's quite interesting and quite classical in this painting is an attempt to place a baby in a contrapposto pose, which isn't a, a type of pose babies usually assume. And though Bingham had, of course, several children and would have had many opportunities to draw babies, he perhaps had difficulty getting his children to, to take a pose, especially a contrapposto pose. So he would have looked to the great artists of the European tradition. And these artists often showed off by placing babies in a contrapposto pose. Now, what is a contrapposto pose? Well, this is a type of pose that the Greeks developed to give a more naturalistic quality to their sculpture. The Egyptians and the early Greeks had done images of figures very stiff, very straight. Well, the 
Ritz discovered that if you put all your weight on one leg and have the other leg relaxed, you get a much more naturalistic representation of the way the human being actually stands. And to create an interesting balanced pose, you have the hips at one angle and the shoulders at another angle. And it's sort of an artificial pose, but it's one that we sometimes will adopt, and it does create a beautiful balanced figural composition. And of course, Raphael, Karachi, Parmigianino, all showing off their ability to place the baby in a contrapposal pose. Bingham, not so much. He's not quite able to reach the level of these classical artists. You know, Bingham never studied anatomy in a formal setting. We know he did not have the sort of academic training that other artists of the era had. He, of course, studied anatomy as best he could from the engravings and books that he collected. And he may have sat in on a class or two when he visited the Pennsylvania Academy of Art, but he didn't have that sort of formal uh, study of the anatomy that most artists in Europe would have had, and of course, these great classical artists above had. So his head of this baby doesn't quite seem to fit on the shoulders in a totally naturalistic way. And this hand is sort of, some people wondered if it's some kind of disembodied hand, but I think in fact that this hand is, he's trying to show the hand resting on the shoulder of the female figure, but it doesn't quite connect with the body so well. But he is clearly trying to do a classical contrapposto pose with the, the way the, the legs are positioned and even with the arms. Nancy Pillsbury Shirley, we have someone who is a student and a patron of art here in Missouri. Her home is in the St. Louis area. But even better, Nancy is a student and a supporter of art that depicts the history of our great state. And best of all, Nancy Pillsbury Shirley is a student and a patron and a supporter of the art of George Caleb Bingham. And when we received, the Friends of Arrow Rock received a very generous offer from Dr. Gary Kramer, the Executive Director of the State Historical Society of Missouri, to co-publish this important book on the collected letters of George Caleb Bingham. Uh, we had to scratch our heads a little bit to see how we were going to be able to do that. But we knew we had a wonderful friend in the Nancy Pillsbury Shirley, who's a uh, an officer and a trustee of the Harriet Pillsbury Foundation in Frontenac, Missouri. And it was thanks to the generosity of the Harriet Pillsbury Foundation that the Friends of Arrow Rock were able to co-publish this book on the letters of George Caleb Bingham. So, Nancy, if you would please come up. my remarks to one minute. Um, I fell in love with Air Rock the minute I won the bid on a dinner at the governor's mansion and Dr. and Mrs. Hall offered their home and we came down here and we just fell in love with this charming town. And I just want to do everything we can to help you continue to reach your goals and we thought this was a good place to start. So thank you very much for my copy of the book. <laughs> the more recent partnership that the Friends of Air Rock and the Society have entered with regard to this wonderful collection of letters uh, allowed us to employ Roger Robinson, who you're going to meet in just a minute, as the first recipient of the James W. Goodrich Research Assistantship. Roger came to us at the beginning of a career as a doctoral PhD student, after spending 20 years in the United States Air Force, including a tour of duty in Baghdad and a career as a B-52 navigator, which seemed appropriate 
preparation for trying to find the letters. <laughs> If Bingham lacked faith in his fellow man, he certainly had a great belief in religion, divine providence, and an assured life after death. Bingham suffered many tragedies in his life, including the deaths of his beloved son Newton, his first wife Sarah Elizabeth, and his second wife Eliza. In each of these hardships, Bingham was consoled by the thought that the departed would be in a better place than those left behind, and that eventually, he and his loved ones would all be united once again. As a youth, Bingham tried his hand at ministry, and his thoughts on religion seemed to come straight from the pulpit. Before he married his first wife, Sarah Elizabeth Hutchison, he instructed her that, if anything merits our chief concern, religion does, not only because we expect it to make us happy in a future life, but because it is the source of our highest enjoyment in this world also. And to James Rollins, upon the death of his best friend's mother, he confided, We are not, however, entirely without consolation, being assured that those who thus, in the fullness of years and virtue, take their departure from us, are but pioneers to that better land, where the sacred ties which unite us here will be renewed, never again to be sundered. We have but to follow their example, and... Our sorrow at no distant period must terminate in joy. Anything I've missed. I think that's it. Thanks for winning.